Hello everyone and welcome to this week's OpenGL 3D game tutorial and this week we're going to be having a look at anti-aliasing and anisotropic filtering. There's not going to be too much actual programming this week because these two techniques are very easy to implement, but if you haven't already implemented them then you'll find that they can make quite a big difference to the visual quality of your game and they're also just pretty interesting techniques to know about. So we're going to be starting off with anisotropic filtering and this is basically just an improved version of MIP mapping which we implemented way back in episode 20. If you remember, MIP mapping uses lower resolution versions of a texture when the surface being textured takes up less pixels on the screen than the dimensions of the original texture. So this happens when the surface is far away from the camera or at a steep angle to the camera. MIP mapping gets rid of this noisy mess that happens when you try to render high resolution textures with lots of information onto surfaces that take up just a few pixels on the screen, and it also increases performance because it's using lower resolution textures when possible. This works very nicely for surfaces that are far away from the camera but still facing the camera, but for surfaces that are at an angle to the camera, the MIP mapping starts to make them appear quite blurred. The reason for this is that the lower resolution versions of the texture that MIP mapping uses are always scaled uniformly, so they always have the same aspect ratio. This is fine for distant objects that are facing the camera, so as you can see here, if this large texture is rendered onto a surface that only takes up 128 by 128 pixels on the screen, then it just uses the 128 by 128 pixel version of the texture, and everything looks good. But when we have surfaces at an angle to the camera, their shape on the screen is likely to be stretched out. When the MIP mapping is carried out for this texture, it will notice that the surface only takes up 128 pixels vertically on the screen, and so it has to use the 128 by 128 version of the texture to avoid aliasing. But horizontally, this surface is much wider than just 128 pixels, and so the 128 by 128 texture has to be stretched out horizontally over the surface, which is what causes the blurring. Anisotropic filtering fixes that blurriness, and you can see the difference that it makes here. So this is what it looks like without any filtering, this is what it looks like with MIP mapping, and this is how it looks with anisotropic filtering, which I think you'll agree is the best looking option. Anisotropic filtering basically achieves this by not only using linearly downscaled versions of the texture like in MIP mapping, but it also uses lower resolution versions of the texture at different aspect ratios. So for situations when the texture is rendered onto a surface at an oblique angle to the camera, anisotropic filtering can use a much more suitable lower resolution version of the texture than MIP mapping can. So let's go ahead and implement this in the code now. So anisotropic filtering has to be set per texture, so we're going to be setting this in the load texture method in the loader class. Now anisotropic filtering isn't actually part of core OpenGL, so we're going to have to use an extension here, and the first thing that we need to do is to check whether that extension is supported by the driver. To check this, we can call glcontext.getCapabilities dots and then we put the name of the extension that we want to check and in this case we want to check gl extension texture filter anisotropic if this is true then we can enable this filtering for the texture here otherwise we can't so we'll just print out a message indicating that anisotropic filtering isn't supported so assuming that anisotropic filtering is supported we then want to specify the amount of anisotropic filtering that we're going to use and the higher we use, the better the quality will be, but as always, the higher quality comes at a higher performance cost. I found that a value of 4 usually works fine, but you can go higher if you prefer, but we should first compare it with the maximum amount that is actually supported. So we're going to set the amount to whichever value is smaller, either our desired amount or the maximum amount actually supported, and to get that value we can call glgetfloat and then put in the name of the value that we want to get which is ext texture filter anisotropic dot gl max texture max anisotropy ext and make sure that you definitely choose the gl max texture max one. Once we've decided on the amount, we can tell this texture to use anisotropic filtering by calling gl text parameter f because we're going to be setting a float parameter of the texture. The texture type is still going to be gl texture 2d. The parameter that we want to set is the anisotropic filtering amount so that's going to be this time GL texture max anisotropy EXT and not the max texture max one. And we then set the value of this parameter to amount. 
You'll also want to set your texture LOD bias to zero if you're using one. And then if you go ahead and run that, you should be able to see a nice increase in the texture quality, especially when looking at surfaces that are at a steep angle to the camera. So that's anisotropic filtering done, and we're now going to have a look at anti-aliasing, specifically anti-aliasing the edges of the polygons. If you have a look closely at the edges of your objects, you may be able to see that they appear quite jagged and pixelated, which is of course exactly the case. Your screen is after all just made up of a finite number of pixels. We're going to be using an anti-aliasing technique called multi-sample anti-aliasing to make the edges of the polygons look a little bit smoother and more natural. Imagine that these are some pixels on your screen and that this is the edge of some polygon that needs to be rendered. When the polygon is being rendered, OpenGL tests which pixels should display the polygon by taking a sample in the middle of each pixel. If the sample is inside the polygon, then the pixel is considered to be inside the polygon, otherwise it isn't. The pixels are either inside the polygon or outside the polygon, which creates a very hard edge, making the individual pixels quite obvious. Multi-sample anti-aliasing addresses this problem by taking multiple samples per pixel instead of just one. So let's imagine the same situation again, but this time four samples are going to be taken for each pixel. This determines whether each of the sub-samples is inside the polygon or not, which gives us something like this. However, we obviously can't just display this on the screen, because this here is still a single pixel and it can only display one colour, so we need to downsample this to the screen's resolution before we can display it. This is known as resolving, and there are many different complicated algorithms for doing this, but for simplicity's sake, we can just imagine that the colour of each pixel is determined by basically averaging all of the subsamples in that pixel. So if I set the colour of each pixel in this example here to be the average of its four subsamples, we get something like this, which perhaps doesn't look that great close up, but it can make quite a big difference in your game. There are actually two ways that we could implement multi-sampling into our game. Uh, the first way involves using frame buffer objects, which I will be covering when we do post-processing effects. But the way that we're going to be using this week depends on the windowing system that you're using, because we basically specified that our display should use a multi-sampled frame buffer. And in Lightweight Java Game Library 2, this can be done by using the pixel format object that we've used as a parameter to the display.create method. All we have to do is to add dot with samples, and then we choose the number of samples that we want to use per pixel. And the more samples we use, the better the quality will be, but it will of course be more expensive. And multi-sampling is actually quite expensive, so I'd recommend sticking to either 4 or 8 samples. Then all we need to do is to enable multi-sampling by calling glenable and putting in glmultisample after creating the display. And that should now work, so let's go ahead and run that, and hopefully the edges of your objects should now look a lot smoother. So that is it for this week. Thank you guys very much for watching this video. Do subscribe if you haven't already. Have a fantastic week, and I will see you all next time.